Good morning and uh, welcome to this presentation on how to avoid predatory publishing with Scopus and Seidel. I am Dion Libbe, I'm the um, Sales Solution Manager for Africa in the Research Division with Elsevier. And it's my pleasure to moderate this session. To introduce you to our speakers today, uh, we have Lucia Skumbi, a Customer Consultant for Research Intelligence in uh, Africa, and Dr. Yehia Aisa, who is a Customer Consultant for Research Intelligence, Intelligence for Elsevier, looking at the northern part of Africa. We have a panel of experts that can answer some questions for everyone, uh, including uh, Dr. Matthew Walker in the UK, a customer consultant that side, Dineshri Moodley, a customer consultant in South Africa, talking from Durban, Khalid Shalon, customer consultant for Elsevier in Sub-Saharan Africa in the North region, and we also have Tracy Chen, who is the product manager for Scopus, and she's based in Beijing. Our agenda for the day will be broken up in two parts. Firstly, we will have an introduction and an overview of predatory publishing with some examples by Lucia Scumbi. And the second part will be an overview of Scopus as a trusted list and a demo of how to use Scopus and Cybal to find information about journals by Yechia Isa. Some housekeeping rules, just to, to let everyone know the session is recorded. All attendees will automatically receive a link to the video. Um, all participants have automatically been muted, but you are welcome to ask questions though. Just kindly submit your questions by using the Q&A feature on the screen. Um, questions will be answered during the course of the webinar. And if, there are, if we have uh, recurring questions, we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. For questions that we do not manage to get to today, we will respond via email in the next few weeks. So please include your name with your question. I know there's a tick box where you can take your name off, but include it and we can get back to you if your question wasn't answered. Uh, please note, certificates will not be issued for this webinar. And that's it from my side for now. I'm going to hand over to uh, Lucia to start and enjoy the webinar. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to switch on my video, uh, if you can see that. So, hi, to, hi, everyone. So, we had a, a large number of registrations for this um, for this webinar this morning. Um, it's almost four thousand, oh. and we we are reaching about six hundred. So, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Dion, for that nice uh, introduction there. Uh, so there are many reasons why we decided to present a webinar on this topic um, and uh, why we also, I guess, why we have such a large audience today. So firstly, because of the scale and the growth of the phenomenon, uh, we have seen, everybody's seen headlines like predatory publishing, sucking science's blood. You know, these can't be, these can't be taken lightly. Um, Despite you know, forming a small proportion of the journals published globally, it is really very clear that, that predatory publishing is a worldwide phenomenon and, and that it is increasing. Secondly, um, while it is widely understood as a bad thing, something to be stopped, something ominous, um, it's threatening, it's something to avoid and uh, not to fall prey to, um, not everybody has a very clear understanding of what exactly it is that we that we refer to when we talk about predatory publishing um, and what it is that you should be looking out for. Then thirdly, there's a widespread uncertainty about what can be done to avoid falling prey to predatory publishing, especially for for individual researchers. So these are the topics that we will be addressing today. So as I mentioned, various studies have, be, have indicated there's an, that there's an escalation in predatory journals. Um, in the study um, from the graph you can see on, on, on the screen, um, this is by Shin and Bo from, from the Hankin School of Economics in Finland. And, and they found that um, uh, more than 420,000 articles in predatory journals were published between 2010 and 2014. And at that time, it was an increase uh, from 2010, where there were about 53,000. Um, so in the graph, the red line that you can see there indicates the overall growth 
uh, while the purple line there is indicating the publishers with, uh, that have about 10 to 99 journals. Um, and those really represent the steepest incline um, um, of the type of publisher which is putting out, which is putting out predatory journals, um, which shows that, that, that predatory publishing is not a small enterprise. Um, another more recent study actually found that there were more than 4,000 journals that had been, that has been involved. Many of them were duped into submitting their papers to predatory publishers. Um, and in Germany alone, there were more than 5,000 scientists that they found that had published in these fraudulent uh, journals. Um, and so we could go on. This is a trend that's it's very clear that it is, that it is on the increase. But what is predatory publishing exactly? Uh, the term itself was coined by Jeffrey Beale. Um, he was a librarian at the, or is still at, at the University of Colorado um, in, in the USA. And it dates back to 2010. Um, it was in a time that, that Beale became an unofficial watchdog of predatory publishing. Um, and he administered a blog on which he listed predatory publishers, you know, journals and um, and the publishers that he considered fr um, fraudulent. Um, so Bill used the term predatory to refer to journals that prey on um, often unsuspecting, uh, unsuspecting or young scholars to submit their manuscripts for the sole purpose of making money from these um, scholars. Uh, so in, in the process, uh, normal good editorial review processes uh, were viola violated and they were not, you know, they were suspended. Uh, so this website closed in um, the beginning of 2017 without any explanation for the closure, uh, but there is some speculation that he was forced to do so by his university, which were, they, they feared, uh, uh, feared uh, legal action against him. Uh, the website is however archived and I think most of or many of you would have seen it um, and it is also being updated by some anonymous members at, at the moment. Uh, the thing is that, that Bill was often criticized for being opposed to, to open access. Um, and so since 2010, uh, when he started his blog, a lot of research has been done into to determine the merit of Bill's criteria and also to try to come up with a, a universally accepted definition. Um, so in last year, last year, the end of last year, I think it was in November, Nature reported that a group of researchers had met, um, gotten together to define predatory publishing. Um, and the conclusion that they made was that these are journals that accept articles for publication along with author's fees, without performing promised quality checks for issues such as plagiarism or ethical approval. So predatory publishing is not the only fraudulent manifestation. Um, while predatory journals are unique, so they, in terms of having their own identity, they have a unique title, they have a, a, um, an editorial board, they have a website. They are also hijacked journals, and these are legitimate academic journals for which duplicate or, 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 or fake websites have been created. And these fake websites then copy the contents of the legitimate website. Um, they copy the impact factor, the ISSN number, the editorial board information, the indexing, all of that information, and then they they use this website to send out calls for papers to researchers all over the world that would recognize the title of this journal and then they would submit the articles to them and then paying often a very high article processing fee. Um, another form um, is also unethical publishing, which is characterized by excessive publication by the editorial board in their own journal. Um, or high article intensity by the same author, like more two, three, or five articles by, by an author in, in the same issue. Uh, you would see excessive co-citation, for example. So there's an arrangement between authors that um, have agreed to always cite each other. 
Um, but this is different from predatory or, or hijacked um, journals because there's no money involved. So it doesn't in, involve article processing fees. All of them nonetheless should be avoided and can be avoided by using Scopus as a trusted source for finding journals. Uh, but the focus today that we're going to talk about is on predatory journals. There's a lot of speculation about why this is a problem, why has it become a problem? And so the literature suggests that it's because academics need to publish these days to further their careers. So often they're looking for easier ways to publish. Um, and so they become vulnerable uh, when publishers reach out to them uh, and ask for their manuscripts. Um, technology also plays a, 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 a a part because it, it, you know, technology makes it easy to set up a fake website, um, to, to spam, to receive electronic payments, etc. And then there's uh, also experience and, and the online environment that also that plays a part um, because in the past um, and still today, decisions about journal subscriptions have traditionally been made by librarians who have a lot of knowledge about journals and and publishers and so on. But when researchers are working online, they don't have access often to librarians to guide them into recognizing some of these um, fraudulent um, aspects that, um, that, the, that the predatory journals use. Um, and then there's also the pay to publish model, uh, open access. Uh, which, which, which provides an, an opportunity to exploit authors um, who pay to, to publish um, so that they can make their work uh, accessible for everyone. But because there is money involved, because they, they pay for this um, open access, this has been exploited um, by these fraud, fraudulent journals. So getting to some of the characteristics, um, and I'm using uh, the information that was what was that came out of the meeting of the researchers that was published by, by Nature got together to define uh, what exactly we mean by predatory publishers. I'm using um, some of the attributes and characteristics that, that they have given. Um, so firstly, you would find false or misleading information, and this would include uh, fake impact factors, incorrect addresses, um, misrepresentation of the editorial board. There would be false claims of indexing or membership of, of, of association, uh, misleading claims about peer review. Um, also deviation from best editorial and publication practices. Um, so you would see something like unprofessional looking web pages, spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, and just irrelevant text often, and these should all raise uh, red flags. Uh, a lack of transparency is, is also one of the characteristics. So you would find, uh, usually on these journal websites, you would find very little or no information about the editorial decisions, how they are made, uh, what fees apply, what type of peer review they use, um, absent content info contact information, um, details about the article processing charges would be very vague. Um, editors and members of the editorial boards would often be, they would be listed sometimes, but you wouldn't be able to verify whether they are real and where to contact them. Um, then finally, aggressive, indiscriminate, um, you know, spamming specifically is a huge um, um, issue with these with these predatory journals. So aggressive solicitation of um, um, sent out to, to authors, such as repeated emails. Um, one giveaway is also flattering, very flattering language. Uh, but a very clear sign would be um, that the invitee's expertise is outside of the journal scope. Um, so if you're working in social sciences and you're getting an invitation from a biochemistry journal, for example, or a journal with the name of biochemistry, um, then that would also be a, a giveaway. Lucia, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we're getting a few comments that uh, the audio is a bit soft. Um, so if you could please uh, move closer to the mic. 
Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll try that. I'll also try to speak up. Is this, is it a little bit better already or not? A little bit better. Yeah. Okay. So just give me a moment to see what I can do. Any better? That's better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So you could ask, does, does it really matter? Um, and yes, it does, because publishing your research in a journal, uh, which makes sure that findings are validated um, by peers, by experts, uh, that it complies with ethical standards, that's really the, 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 the highlight. It's, it's the pinnacle for researchers, because from here, it can make a contribution. Your research can make a contribution to science. It can make a contribution to society, uh, because it is read, um, it is cited um, and it adds to your success as a, as a, as a researcher. It uh, really contributes to your performance. Um, and on the other hand, publishing in a predatory journal will result in monetary costs um, to the institution because they always ask for article processing uh, fees. There'll be reputational costs to you and to your employer and your employability. Uh, research and, um, and funding will be, will be wasted. The time that you put into is wasted. The funding is wasted. And then some practical aspects. So, so um, there's, there's no effort to do any archiving or to really listing it with indexes. So it decreases readability of the, of the research. Uh, but worst of all, it compromises the science system because validation uh, or peer review by other experts is really the cornerstone of science. So, and if it has not gone through this process, then it is not really scientific and it does not um, provide a good foundation for other researchers to, to build on. So what does predatory publishing look like? I have a few examples that I want to share with you. So firstly, spamming um, would look like would, would look like this. So you would not really, so often it's not really distinguishable from a genuine journal. So very common names, global journal of something, something would be used. Uh, it would often come from um, low or middle income countries, but not always. Sometimes it is from US, uh, UK and so on. Uh, flattering um, personal greetings um, is one of the characteristics, like ex esteemed researcher, even you've just finished your honors or your master's degree. Um, it would be indexed in illegitimate um, abstract and indexing services. Uh, so if you go and look, these are not indexes um, at all. Um, and then there would be no academic information about the sender of the of the email that is asking um, for you to send your manuscript to be published. So what to do? This is the big question. The big questions. And at the moment, there are two ways that researchers and librarians check for predatory journals. And the one is through lists, um, checklists. Um, uh, so there's the, there's the Beals list, uh, there's the Scopus discontinued list, the Directory of Open Access uh, journals, delisted uh, journals, there's uh, Jajalian's list, there's Cabal's International, which is a subscription uh, service. Um, but a recent study uh, by Nature also indicated that there are more than 90 of these checklists. So it's really unrealistic to expect researchers to go through all of these lists. And then in the top right corner, you can also see an analysis that was done, which shows that there's inconsistency between these lists. A journal would be in one list, but excluded from another list. Um, so this is um, why we really recommend um, that we use, instead of using lists that have um, um, sort of, indicate to you these are these are the the journals that you should avoid should avoid you, you should rather or we recommend that you you use a list like scopus 
which is an approved list which all of the journals that are in there have gone through a process and we will explain um, what that process is exactly um, so that that can be used um, as a trusted list instead of having to go through all of the other lists uh, that have um, indications of those that you should avoid. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Okay. So we want to pause at this time because uh, there's something that we would like to ask you and then we'll move on to the next session uh, we will, where we will talk about why you can trust Scopus and Cybal and exactly how to do that. Uh, Dineshri, I just see the poll is closed after one vote. Can we reopen that one? Hi, uh, sure. Um, Lucia, would you mind to um, mention the questions out loud for those that are watching on YouTube because they can't see the polling screen, but they can vote in the comment section of the YouTube video. So if you can just please read out the questions for the poll. Okay, so our, our first question is, have you ever received an email inviting you to publish your research? The second question is, do you believe that predatory publishing is harmful to science? And then the third question is, do you have a better idea of how to recognize a predatory journal after the first session that we've had now? So I see there are some indication that not everybody is um, exactly sure still, so we can still maybe address that in the Q&A after the session, if you have any further questions. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for, um, thanks for contributing to this poll. Um, interesting results. Thank you for the feedback. And then we'll move on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Yahya Isa, Customer Consultant within the Research Intelligence Department of Elsevier, uh, covering parts of Africa. And uh, in this part, uh, I'll go through why uh, we can trust uh, the sources or the journals available on Scopus and SciVal. So I'll first start by giving a, a brief introduction on what is Scopus, what does uh, Scopus cover, or the coverage of Scopus, and then uh, what are the criteria that a journal must meet in order for it to be indexed in Scopus, followed by uh, how we eliminate uh, journals which are in Scopus and start exhibiting uh, some uh, predatory uh, characteristics. Uh, so if we start with what is Scopus, so Scopus uh, is a source neutral, neutral expert curated database of peer reviewed literature. It's indexing the abstracts and the citations of the articles and the journals included in Scopus. So by source neutral, we mean uh, it's not favoring one publisher over another. Uh, it's covering uh, content from over 5,000 publishers around the globe. By expert curated, we mean that there is an independent board uh, called the Content Selection Advisory Board or CSAB. And it's made up of uh, 17 experts who are the ones who select which journals uh, are meeting the criteria in order for them to be indexed in Scopus and which ones are not. By independent, we mean they are not Elsevier employees and they are experts within their own subject areas. Scopus could be used for uh, different uh, use cases. The most simple use case would be if you want to search for documents within a specific topic where uh, you are working on. So you can, of course, use Scopus for that. Of course, you can also use it to determine uh, which journals you want to publish your work in. Uh, you can also use it to follow experts, uh, authors or researchers in specific fields, along with institutions. Of course, you can use it to track the research and evaluate the research performance of entities. If we talk about Scopus uh, coverage, uh, currently there are over 78 million records available on Scopus coming from 24,000 serial titles currently active on Scopus, along with over 100,000 conferences and over 220,000 uh, books. Uh, Scopus is, uh, 
has a broad coverage, so it's covering uh, the four main subject areas, uh, physical sciences, health sciences, social sciences, and life sciences. Uh, there is an almost even distribution between the those four broad subject areas. So it has a really broad coverage, and it's also covering over uh, 40 languages of publications. And in fact, over 20% of the titles in Scopus are in languages uh, other than English. So now if we start about, so what does it take or what are the characteristics a journal must meet in order for it to be indexed in Scopus? And this falls in line with how to avoid the publishing in predatory journals. So first, the first stage is that all titles should meet all the minimum criteria, which is it must be peer reviewed. It should have English abstracts, must have a published uh, ethics statement. 80% uh, of the references must be in Roman script. And it should be at least two years old. So it should be active for at least the previous two years before applying for it to be published in Scopus. And once it meets, uh, once any journal meets these minimum criteria, then it can go uh, for review by the Content Selection and Advisory Board, the CSAB. And they go. Through, uh, they make a thorough examination of each journal uh, being considered for indexing in Scopus, uh, covering the parts about the journal policy. Is there a convincing editorial uh, policy? What type of peer review is this uh, journal conducting? Uh, there must be some sort of uh, geograph geographical diversity in both the editorial board and the authors submitting their manuscripts to this journal. They also follow up on the quality of content uh, this journal is publishing. Is it contributing uh, to the field it's working on, the clarity of the abstracts, and whether the uh, submitted articles or manuscripts to this journal are falling in line with the aims and scopes of that journal. They also look at the journal status. Who are the editors? Are they experts within their fields or not? And they also check whether the articles published in the journal have been cited previously in journals indexed in Scopus or not. They also check the regularity of publication uh, in the journal, making sure that there are no delays in the publication schedule of the journal. And they also check the online availability. Each journal uh, available on Scopus should have its content available online, should have an online homepage with an English online uh, homepage, and they also look at the quality or uh, of the website of the journal. So, as I mentioned, so the Scopus selection process eliminates journals with predatory characteristics. Like we said, the editorial board, they must be, they check if those are real, uh, editors and if they are experts within their fields or not. Of course, uh, along with many other things, if I, of course, there should be the publication ethics statement as well, which is uh, stating the responsibilities of, of the publisher, of the journal, of the editors, and of the authors as well. Of course, they have some data about the copyright and access issues of what's published in the journal. The website should be relevant, uh, available to all according to standards, as we said, publication schedule should be clearly stated and there shouldn't be any delays. Ownership and management of the journal should be clear who owns it, it's not misleading, along with the name of the journal should be clear, not misleading or confusing. So all those are initially uh, criteria which uh, would give us uh, some sense of trust to put available in scopes. Now, if some, if some journals start exhibiting a predatory behavior after they are index in Scopus, so there are several ways to curate the content of Scopus. So there are three ways uh, which are currently uh, being, being done to, in order to start filtering out uh, the bad apples from the basket, let's say. So the first one is uh, there could be direct feedback from users and stakeholders about the uh, poor performance, poor performance uh, or the journals performing poorly. So So uh, if there is feedback submitted to the title uh, suggestion team at Scopus and it's credible, then they will investigate it and uh, in order to reevaluate this title. Another way is the identification of poor performing journals using metrics uh, and benchmarks. And we will go uh, in the next slide about what are these metri metrics and benchmarks, which would cause for a journal to be reevaluated by the Content Selection Advisory Board. And then there is the rad radar tool, which is also used to 
predict journals with outlier behaviors. By outlier, we mean that there is a, a sudden jump or exponential jump in the numbers of uh, of documents published by this journal. There is a sudden change in the citation behavior of this journal, or maybe there's a sudden change in the geographical distribution of authors submitting their papers to this journal. So these three criteria uh, will then the journals meeting any of these three criteria, which we hope they don't, will then be reevaluated by the content selection advisory board, and then they will make the decision whether this journal should continue being a Scopus or whether it should be discontinued uh, from Scopus. So if we look at the second one, which is the identification of poor performing journals uh, using metrics and benchmarks, so this is a table showing what are those uh, metrics and benchmarks which are used to identify poor performing journals. And then all of those six metrics, we are always comparing journals with the journals of the same within its own subject field because we know that different subject areas have different uh, behaviors and the citations and the numbers of articles and so on. So in this case, each criteria will be uh, compared to peer journals within its subject field. So the first one is about the self-citation rate. So if it's exhibiting 200% more than of self-citations more than its peer journals, then this will call for a re-evaluation. The total citation rate is less than 50 of its peers. The site score is less than 50% of its peers within, within its subject area. Numbers of articles is less than 50%. Uh, number of full text clicks on Scopus as well is less than 50%. And the abstract usage on Scopus is less than 50%. Now, regarding the radar tool, as I mentioned, so in this case, we are trying to detect outlier uh, journals. Uh, for example, uh, as I said, there's a uh, exponential increase in the numbers of uh, documents suddenly being published by the journal, a uh, sudden change in the ge geographical diversity of the, of the authors publishing their works to the journal and so on. So here's an example uh, of, the uh, of the radar tool, which is identifying journals with outlier performance. So we can see that in this specific case, in 2011, this journal is publishing uh, six, 61 documents, whereas in 2014, it's suddenly publishing around 1,000 documents. So this is an outlier behavior, and this calls for this journal to be reinvestigated and see why is this there is uh, such a huge jump in the numbers of documents published by, the, by this journal, and it's up to the Content Selection Advisory Board to, to, to flag it as a predatory journal and discontinue it from Scopus or not. Here's another example of uh, outlier performance, uh, which would be caught using the radar tool. In this case, it's the number, uh, other than the exponential increase in the number of documents published by this journal, but there's an also uh, unexplained behavior uh, from in the geographical distribution from the authors to this journal, where we can see that uh, over the past two years, a specific country has a huge jump of the number of journals published in this, uh, in the number of manuscripts published in this journal. So this calls for an investigation on why that is happening. So now, so the re-evaluation process. So if, if one of the journals is not meeting uh, one of the criteria and the metrics and benchmark table, which I've shown earlier, is not being met by the journal. So uh, the first year it's flagged and the publisher of this journal is, is informed. If nothing is happening during the first year, the second year, another flag is, uh, is sent and uh, the publisher is informed that there is a, a performance issue with this journal. If for two years nothing happens, then the CSAB, the Content Selection Advisory Board, will reevaluate this title based on the scope of selection criteria which we discussed in the beginning. Now, if a journal was identified by the radar tool to be reevaluated by the Content Selection Advisory Board on the year where the radar tool detected an outlier behavior, and it's the same thing with journals which are flagged uh, based on, in this case, uh, the CSIB uh, will re-evaluate this title on the same year where it was, uh, where the where the flag or the concern was raised based, again, on the Scopus selection uh, criteria. And in all cases, the CSIB will decide whether this journal should continue being in Scopus or whether it should be discontinued from Scopus. So it's really important that 
when we are searching for a journal on Scopus to make sure that it is still current point in time are not in Scopus any longer. And how can we do that? We have the Scopus uh, discontinued source list and the link is available here as well. And there you can check what are the sources which were in Scopus but are no longer in Scopus. And this could give you an idea of uh, which uh, journals to avoid when publishing in Scopus. And in the demo, I'll also show you how we can do that on the Scopus website uh, directly. So what happens when Azure so what happens when a journal uh, or when a decision is made to discontinue a journal, the, publishers, the publisher of this journal is informed of the decision of the Scopus team or, or of the CSAB that this journal will no longer be indexed in Scopus. And in that case, no new content will be added to Scopus from this journal. Uh, therefore, any, any, any articles published in this journal from the date it was discontinued will not appear on Scopus. But the older, uh, publications which were published in this journal while it was in Scopus will remain on Scopus in exceptional cases where there was severe unethical publication practice this content could be removed but normally the one the articles which were published when this journal was in Scopus will remain on Scopus. Here are also some uh, more information which uh, you may find useful about uh, Scopus content uh, curation and revaluation. So all of these uh, links will be in the slides, which will be shared with you uh, after the presentation. So now, how can we use uh, Scopus to find the relevant uh, journals? Uh, I will switch now to uh, demo view. So I will switch to my uh, browser. But in any case, we also have screenshots uh, in the presentation here, which you might find uh, useful. So, okay. So now, uh, here now you should be seeing my uh, browser on the Scopus homepage. And if we want to see the full list of sources which are available in Scopus, if you just go here and click on the Sources tab, we should find the full list of active and inactive titles uh, which are available in Scopus. So currently there are 41,000 active and inactive titles available in Scopus, but as I said, we always want to make sure that the journal we select is still actively indexed in Scopus. And uh, I'll show you now how to do it. Of course, uh, here you can filter out uh, this list by subject area. So for example, if you are looking for a journal within a specific subject area, you can just click on subject area and write your subject area. Uh, which subject area you're looking for and that will give you a list of all the journals available within that subject area. And if you have the title of a specific journal and want to ensure whether this journal is in fact indexed in Scopus or not, you can also change the filter here to be by title and just start writing the title of the journal to make sure whether it is indexed in Scopus or not. So now each journal which is uh, indexed in Scopus, so if we go here, for example, by searching by title, So if I'm, for example, I'm searching for the solar energy journal, want to make sure whether it's indexed in Scopus or not, it should appear in the search results. And that case, we can just click on the uh, name of the journal to open the journal profile on Scopus and see whether it's still indexed in Scopus or not. And what are the metrics uh, available for this journal, which could give us uh, an insight about the quality of the journal or where it stands. Uh, within one compared to its peers within the same subject fields of the journal. Okay. So in this case, we'll have here the title of the journal, the Scopus coverage years. So 
for how long has this been has this journal had its content covered in Scopus? So in this case, it has been since 1957 until presently. So we are sure that it is still indexed in Scopus. If it's been discontinued from, from Scopus, normally we find between uh, circle brackets that it will clearly state uh, this journal has been discontinued from Scopus. And it will say which year it has been discontinued from. We also have the publisher, who the publisher of this journal is, what are the subject areas in which this journal is publishing in. And then we have some journal level metrics, which will give us some insight about the quality uh, of this journal compared to other journals within its field. So the first one is the site score, which is a, a measure of the average number of citations received by the documents of this journal over the number of documents published in the journal over the past three years. So for example, if we are talking about the site score 2018, we'll see how many citations were received in the year 2018 for the documents published during the past three years in this journal. So in that case, it will be 2015 through 2018. And of course, we can confirm it. We can click here to see who exactly is citing the documents of this journal during the past three years. and what are the documents published in this journal during the past three years? So this is a metric which has given us uh, the average citations per publication over the past three years within this journal. But more importantly is that we, as I, as I said, mentioned earlier that the citation behavior differs for different fields. So we want, in order to have a fair comparison, we should always compare it within its subject area. So if we go down here and we find that uh, we have the site score rank, which will give us its rank within each of the subject areas in which uh, this journal is, uh, is attributed to. So for the first one in material science, general material science, it will tell us that this is journal number 49 out of 438 journals with, which have this subject area in Scopus, which puts it in the 88th percentile or the top 12% of journals within this specific subject area. And within the other subject area, which is about renewable energy, sustainability, and the environment, in this case, it is journal number, ranked number 24 out of 153 with this same subject area. And in this case, it puts it in the 84th percentile or the top 16% of journals within this specific subject area. So those are journal level metrics, which will give us a sense of the quality of this journal within its subject area. We also have the SJR, which is a normalized metric. And in this case, it's measuring not just the quantity of the citations, but rather the quality of the citations. So it's, it's seeing where the citations to, this, to the articles or the documents of this journal are received from. And when, we are receive, when this journal is receiving citations from prestigious journals, then somehow the prestigiousness is contagious and it increases the quality of the content of this journal. In this case, one is the benchmark, anything above one is above the world average. And we also have the source normalized impact per paper, which is also a normalized metric and it's measuring the raw impact per paper within the subject area for the documents published in this journal versus the one, the raw impact per paper for, for papers published in the same field, or similar field. So in this case, also one is our benchmark, anything above one will be above the world average. So all those are, uh, so we've now learned how to find the full list of sources in Scopus, how to search for, for one either by its title or within a specific subject area. And then for each one, you can always open its profile, know the content cover, the Scopus coverage years, whether it's still actively indexed in Scopus or not, and you have the journal level metrics uh, like the site score, the site score percentile, the site score rank, and the SciMago journal, journal rank, the SGR, and the SNP or the source normalized impact per paper. And maybe one way to avoid hijacked uh, journals, which Lucia presented, would be that you here will have the link to the journal homepage. So if you just click on it, it will redirect you to the journal homepage when maybe this would be a way uh, to avoid the. Um, uh, the hijacked journals or publishing in the wrong uh, one, in the wrong uh, hijacked journal. This is a quick overview on uh, how we can be using uh, Scopus uh, for, for, for identifying journals uh, which are expert curated to, to publish in. And quickly we can do that on 
we can view the research performance of a journal on Cybal as well. So journals are now a new entity which have been added to Cybal. And there you can view, if I just open the overview uh, module, and this case here on the left-hand panel, the last one now is Scopus Sources. And you can add the Scopus Source, you can just uh, search for it by its name. So in this case, we have the one of solar energy already open to us. And under the summary, it will also give us the uh, main metrics, the site score, the source normalized impact per paper, and the Saimago journal rank. But you also have the scholarly output. Uh, how many papers is it publishing in, and the field-weighted citation impact, which is measuring the quality of, public, of articles published by this entity versus similar articles having the same age, type, and subject area. And you also have out its outputs and top citation percentiles, so uh, the fraction of journals uh, of, of articles published in this journal, which are in the top 10% most cited worldwide. So this is a general overview, but you can always have it here on year, which could actually be beneficial for the radar tool to see if this journal is exhibiting outlier behavior or not. So if you look here at the scholarly output year on year, you see that I'd say this is a healthy growth. It's not an exponential growth. It could be an explainable growth, though. Uh, this should be fine. This seems fine. And you can also know the outputs and top citation percentiles, which are more or less uh, uh, not varying over the past uh, six years. So you can say that uh, the quality of publications of this journal are not varying a lot uh, year by year. Of course, here as well, you can see under cited uh, the field weighted citation impact uh, year on year to see if there is any major changes in the quality of the publications of this journal. And in this case, you can see that they are more or less uh, standard. Of course, 2019 we'll always use it with care because it's still an incomplete year. It should be incomplete uh, June this year. So this is a quick overview uh, about uh, finding the journals uh, on both Scopus and Cybel and why you should trust them. And uh, I believe uh, this is, uh, I am done. And I will now hand over back to uh, Lucia. Thank you. So it's also important for us, um, give me a minute. Right. So it's, it's also for us, um, you know, to get the message across that it is, we are very reliant um, on getting information from researchers. Very short, sorry um, to interrupt. We're just on your presenter view now. There we go. That's better. That's better. Okay. So we are very reliant on getting feedback um, from authors, librarians, um, academics to let us know when you notice that a journal has become predatory or, or is predatory or even if you only suspect uh, that the that the quality is not up to standard. So we really invite you to contact us um, because we have such a large audience today that are from different locations. Please reach out to your local rep Scopus representative and share this information. Um, there are other bodies, and I saw in the Q and A um, there were a few questions about what can we do when we have um, already accidentally published within such a journal or when we want to you know, take action. Um, so one of the bodies that is really um, responsible for this is the Committee on Publications Ethics, COPE. Uh, they have a website, publicationethics.org, and I've also included on the slide, if you can see um, the address where you can, or the um, the web address where you, email address where you can, be, where you can reach out um, and, and discuss the issue uh, with COPE. Um, there's also the World Association of Medical Editors um, that um, are also very concerned about this and that um, can advise and also take action against, um, against predatory journals. Um, so please, uh, this is everybody's responsibility. And even though we do many checks, it is, is we do rely a lot on feedback from from authors to assist us to really combat these predatory journals. Um, so we also wanted to share some useful sources with you. And one of them is a Researcher Academy, um, which is also made available by Elsevier. Um, 
Um, and this platform contains a whole number of uh, training material courses and one of them specifically addresses predatory publishing as well. So this is a, a very useful um, site for, for authors and for academics um, to upskill your knowledge and make sure that you are aware of uh, um, various issues within the publishing domain, uh, but specifically there are also courses that uh, can help you to understand better about, about predatory publishing. Um, there's also um, a thing check and submit. So this is a cross industry initiative um, led by various um, of the stakeholders within the publishing uh, landscape that have come together and put together a, a, a website to support um, researchers in making sure that they do not submit um, publications to a to a predatory publisher so as um, Kierke mentioned also it is, is it, it is, is a good starting place for Scopus but it is also necessary to go to the actual website it's an, in it's in any case very important to do that to make sure that your manuscript uh, compliance with the aims and the scope um, of of the journal. So going to the actual website as well is very important. And, and this um, service, Think, Check and Submit, really guides you um, in terms of being able to know and look out for those uh, aspects that should be avoided within a journal and provide simple guidelines there for authors to assess a journal before, before submitting. Um, so in conclusion, um, our very short and simple message is that predatory publishing is on the rise around the globe. It is really a threat to the integrity of science and the reputation of researchers. So before submitting your article, really make sure of at least one thing and that the, the, the journal is indexed in Scopus. So with that, we come to the end of our presentation. We have a little bit, uh, we are actually, you know, on time now. Um, so we've had an hour for this webinar, but we can make a few minutes available if there are any questions. Um, hi, Lucia. I can begin with some of the questions from Q&A. Um, major question is a lot of uh, the attendees are asking, what happens if somebody did publish in a predatory journal? Um, what kind of impact does this have on their career? Uh, yes, thanks for that question. This, this is not an easy, this is not an easy one to, to really answer because it can, it can have an impact on your career. So whenever you apply for a position or for a grant or, or something like that, um, Often they would go through the publication list and um, it would be noticed if you had published in a predatory journal. Um, so it is important when this has happened is to do your best to try to have the article retracted. So contact um, the publisher, uh, the journal editor, ask for your article to be retracted. And then I would say contact um, um, contact COPE, um, so the Committee on Publishing Ethics, um, they would be in the best position to advise and to assist you in getting your article retracted. Um, is this also the uh, board that you can go to to report predatory journals? Yes, you, could all, you can also report, you can also report to them, um, uh, but it would also be, yes, yes. Okay, because that's another um, frequently asked question. Um, Khaled, do you have many questions from YouTube? Yeah, so um, we're having some questions on, uh, so one of the questions that we've received is, how usable is an article that was published in a predatory journal? Uh, with other, how would other people uh, cite it or use it a bit later in the research? Uh, that's one of the questions. Uh, another thing is, uh, do usually predatory journals, uh, so um, if already a journal has, been, has published uh, an article and it turned out to be a predatory, uh, republishing it again, would it be okay if I just resubmit it elsewhere? That's another question. Uh, 
uh, and one last thing is uh, more on the identification of the hijacked journals. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to answer these questions? Would you like me to go ahead? Um, I can answer. Oh, okay, so so nor normally, if mm -hmm. you have uh, published in a predatory journal uh, an article, uh, no, you cannot republish the same article in another journal which is not predatory. So that's why you need to. The journal selection process is a really important process in the publishing uh, cycle. So you need to. Uh, as much as you can make sure that what you are publishing in is a trustworthy journal and not a predatory journal. Uh, regarding about uh, the uh, the first question about uh, the visibility or the citations you can receive for uh, an article which was published in a predatory journal. Well, I mean, uh, no one can say uh, uh, no, it won't receive citations. Of course, it can receive citations, but the thing is, uh, where is it receiving citations from? Where is this journal? Which databases is, is this journal indexed in anyways? And if it's a predatory journal, most likely uh, there is a very high possibility it won't be indexed in the trustworthy databases, uh, such as Scopus. So the citations received for your article won't be appearing uh, on your author's Scopus profile, let's say. And besides, and I, I would say that it would also be affecting the chances of your, uh, of your citations because um, authors will normally, if they are aware that this is a predatory journal, they will normally uh, not read the publications or the articles published in that journal. So it will also be affecting uh, your chances of citations that, in that matter. So going back to my first point, it's selecting the right journal is a really important aspect in the publication life cycle. What was um, the uh, last question? Uh, the, oh, the last question was about hijacked journals, so I can maybe answer that. Um, so I, I think I mentioned during uh, the presentation that it is a bit harder uh, to differentiate um, hijacked journals, and the only way to do that is to really thoroughly uh, investigate um, the websites of those of those journals, and a, a, and a, and, a, and a very secure way of doing that is to use the the website link that is provided on Scopus, because that would be the legitimate link of the legitimate journals. So that is one of the foolproof ways of making sure that you're submitting to the legitimate uh, journal and not um, to the one that has been hijacked. Thank you. you so, uh, yes, go, go on yeah, sorry, <laughs> I just wanted to add to that question uh, that uh, Lucia just answered because there's quite a few people that asked, uh, you know, if I submit my manuscript today and six months down the line, the board decide to remove the journal from being indexed by Scopus, will my paper still be considered that it was submitted to a, a legitimate journal or not? And uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, the journal, if the journal is predatory and it has been discontinued in Scopus, then it is predatory. Um, so, so yes, it, it will still be considered as being published in a predatory journal. So we take as, this is unfortunately not a very quick process. There has to go in a lot of investigation before we can uh, for sure, uh, determine that a journal is is um, for, you know that it is fraudulent. Um, so um, there is some some time lag before a journal can be removed from Scopus. But um, the short answer to that is yes, the journal is still going to be considered predatory. Thank you. Um, there, there, there is something I might, I, I just might want to add to this discussion. Um, so uh, I, I've personally, and, and you might also correct me on this, uh, we've heard cases of people submitting uh, papers before to editors of quality journals. And uh, one of the feedback they got is that they uh, cited and referred to predatory journals and uh, we've heard many cases of editors of top quality journals refusing manuscripts because they are not, uh, they are skeptical of the references being used 
the manuscript. Uh, is this something that uh, you've also seen with, uh, uh, with a lot of researchers happening on? Um, yes, Khaled, are you asking us in the panel? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yes, definitely, yes. So editors would definitely go through the reference list of all the manuscripts that are being submitted and they would definitely pick up um, on journals that are fraudulent, predatory, hijacked, um, and they would be uh, very cautious or they would uh, absolutely re reject that. Thank you. Thank you. I think there was another one from Dineshri. Uh, yes, thanks so much, Dion. Um, just wanting to draw a distinction as well that um, a lot of the questions coming through are, um, if the journal asks me to pay for publishing, does that automatically mean that the journal is predatory? Um, and the answer to that is no. Um, open access journals do charge for publishing, so it doesn't automatically mean that the journal is a predatory journal. Um, you can use the other characteristics that Nisha and Yehia have um, educated us on today to kind of ident identify these characteristics and navigate away from predatory journals. Um, other than that comment, um, the question I have for the panelists is, if a lot of um, African researchers um, are receiving, um, well, feeling that they're falling prey to predatory journals because they feel that it's um, attractive to them to publish in these journals because the journal metrics are kind of um, skewed. So they get these invites. Do you think that it's more likely that African researchers could fall prey to predatory journal publishing for this reason, for the fact that they feel that um, it's more attractive to get accepted into journals with higher metrics, even though those journals may be fake? What do you think about this? Well, I, you know, there's a lot of research that have that have gone into that, and it is showing that um, it's a global phenomenon that um, researchers across the world are falling prey to to predatory uh, journals. So I, I personally, it would not. Um, like to single out specific countries or specific researchers. I think, um, you know, research across the world, um, researchers are really under pressure to publish. Um, there's a lot of talk about publish or perish. Um, so I think researchers across the world are really, um, you know, vulnerable. And, and we have seen that uh, there's a trend across the world for, for researchers because it's the the predatory publishers are, are becoming, um, you know, so skilled at what they're doing, uh, so th so they can often, so they can often, sort of trap any uh, researchers. So maybe that's a personal uh, personal opinion, and maybe my colleagues want to comment on that. But uh, but that is how I see that. I think it's maybe a good point to uh, just ask each of the panel if there is a, a final comment as we are 15 minutes into the questions. Uh, if there's something specific that popped up, uh, if you want to have a closing comment, um, can I start with Lucia? Um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Dion. No, so I don't have any specific. I think we've had very, very good questions. I really hope this has been been um, helpful um, in, in providing some guidance um, and I really want to invite all the participants, um, even if you are not subscribing to Scopus, Scopus also has a free access uh, for their journals to use Scopus because a lot of um, focus is, you know, um, or a lot of effort goes into making sure that the journals in Scopus are are not predatory, so so that, that's a very good um, and a very uh, it's a it's an efficient and a simple way of making sure um, that you are not sending your manuscript to a journal that is predatory. Thank you for that, uh, Yahya. Any closing comments from you? Uh, yes, my comment would be uh, please. Uh, 
to do not fall prey to publishing in predatory journals, especially when you are contributing with a scientifically sound article. Just take the extra step, extra time to ensure that you are publishing in a non-predatory journal, which is well respected within field within, within its field and uh, indexed in the uh, trusted uh, databases. Uh, just take this extra step because it's really a wasted effort uh, when you when you do not know and you really have a good article but you just uh, had a wrong choice of publishing it in a predatory journal. That's it. Thank you for that, uh, Daneshri. Thank you, Dion. Um, just from my side to encourage um, mid-career researchers to use the research academy to build their understanding around um, research metrics, identifying the right journal to publish in and utilizing the tools available to them. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Tracy, are you still on? Uh, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you, Dean, for the chances to speak up here. Uh, well, my comments is that uh, actually publishing ethics is a very serious or um, how do you say it's about science integrity. And uh, we are here to to tell or to really share our experiences or knowledges about predatory publishing and really to h help your, the audience um, how to identify them, how to avoid them, and how to publish your best research work in an appropriate venue. And I do hope that is helpful. And it's never an easy answer or a simple judgment on simple, simple criteria. And also bear in mind that this is uh, a dynamic market and journal might be legitimate previously, but you know, due to some editorial changes or other things, they may become predatory. So, I mean, dynamic means that it's not always easy to timely, uh, you know, tackle them or find them and to discontinue them. So, if any researchers or participants here you identify uh, any abnormal or um, you know strange thing happens, do feel free to report to us and take the appropriate practices to your best knowledge. And yeah, lastly, and good luck with everyone with publishing, uh, you know, uh, your good work in reputable journals. Thank you for that, um, Khalid. Yes, um, so um, just a last word of advice. I know in many cases it might seem uh, a lot easier to just publish with a, with a persistently nagging journal that's asking you for your paper. Uh, but if but your quality work and your quality research uh, deserves to be trusted, deserve that people know about it, use it, and feel confident about your work. So uh, taking the extra effort to go to carefully select the journal that you will be entrusting with your work, with all the sweat and effort that you've put for a long time with your research, to gain the visibility, to gain the credibility that you actually deserve. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think let's wrap that up. Thank you, everybody, once again for uh, dialing in for your time to uh, listen to this presentation. We uh, believe it would have been great value for you all, and we invite you to uh, log into our website at uh, elsevier.com to see more of our products and get in touch with our representatives in your area. So, uh, if there's any information or any issues that we can help with, we will gladly assist. Thank you, everybody. And just a reminder, I saw there was a lot of questions on will the presentation be available. A link will be sent to all the participants uh, to this video recording, so you'll have the answers afterwards. And we will also look at the questions and answers. If they all the questions, if there's something that we didn't answer that's important, we uh, will come back on email to that as well. Thank you very much. Have a great day further. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.